can we just get back to where we are today? We all have our own views on republicanism, our different types of republicanism. There's men there that have fought an armed campaign against Britain's occupation of Ireland. There's men that have spent time in jail for it. But we are where we are today. So let's look at it from there. I would like to ask the panel, my next door neighbour is a soft nationalist. His worry is, who's going to pay his pension? Well, he has to pay to go and see a doctor. What happens if he needs hospital treatment? His knees are bad. How long will he have to wait in your Irish Republic? Regardless if it's a socialist republic, we can assure him we can have it done immediately. That's if we get a socialist republic. Ireland doesn't have a great history of practicing socialism. The Irish voter doesn't have great support to socialism. I think we frighten the soft unionist with re socialist republic. Frightens the soft unionist. And I think those are the people, similar to my next door neighbour, that we have to look at. And I would just like to ask the panel, how do we approach that the soft unionist, the soft nationalist, who worries more about the few bob, as does the soft unionist, by the way, and the brothers, whose children are going to school. They worry about them things, and those are the subjects that have to be discussed. There they talk about the Scottish Nationalist Party and what they done. I think they published a 640 page book, booklet, on the Scottish referendum. <coughs> I, I think that all must come to it, and it must be led by Republicans because nobody else seems to have an interest in it. So there's a, a massive task in front of us all. And just, I'm not sure how we get there, so we just like to have the panel's view on it. Just, for, as you, when you talk sometimes, uh, when people talk about the, the soft unions, and that we've been in, 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 in talks and negotiations are with maybe not so soft unionists, but I guess prisoners from a loyalist background. And one, one case in particular, several of us left socialist Republicans sitting in the room, some of them in the room here today, and an ex-loyalist uh, prisoner got up and tore stripes out of people who were attacking the establishment. Tore stripes out of them. And it was the best socialist speech of her name. <coughs> and another one was a Church of Ireland vicar who tore stripes out and through Amos and through the Bible and through socialism. It was an amazing experience for me. So not all unionists, as Dirty had said earlier, or loyalists are opposed to Irish unity, actually. And, and what, they, what they realise is that the woman in the Falls Road is struggling for a loaf that's the same as the woman in the Shanker Road. And they bought all this, you can't eat flags and stuff to get that. But what they're really asking for is, well, show us. But that's what this, the like of this is trying to do here. That's what the Yes for Unity is trying to do, I believe, and that's what Dirty's art document is trying to do as well. Today's the first time I've seen it. Yeah, well, that's out, it's, it's out about, about two years now. But it, it, these things yeah, do all, take time. All the more yeah, I understand. But yeah, these, these things do take time. But um, as for the, the nationalists, I believe that the, the, the person said, you know, who's, who's going to pay my health care? I'll tell you what, why we will get it. You see that person sits at home and waits for some, excuse me, or not even use language, leader to ride in on a horse and lead them to victory. We're going nowhere. Look where we are now, by following leaders and by following people who promised us false promises and false dawns. We need people power. There's two ways to win the revolution. Armed struggle or mass movement of people. The first one failed, I'm afraid. So what we need is a mass movement of people Protestant, Catholic, and the centre to challenge the establishment. Well, I think your question is very valid, and I suppose on the document you have it now, which is a good thing, and I suppose it just shows conversations like this is important, even about the dissemination of information um, and just engaging other people that you don't normally. But I mean, the question that you say about your neighbour, that's the type of people that we need to win over and convince. The same as my friends. Some of my friendship group um, who wouldn't be Republicans wouldn't be activists in a sense, either in the community or in a political sense. And they are the people that we need to win over, not just within our own communities or next door, but right across communities and right across um, society. And we need to be giving them our viable alternative as to what a new system. I mean, me saying a social and economic system, what does that mean? But, you know, to your next door neighbour. Um, who doesn't converse in this type of engagement or politics or language. So we need to be careful around the language. We had a discussion earlier even as well around if a, if a referendum was announced, 
even the role of social media and how we communicate. I mean, even when you look at Britain um, in terms of Brexit, the role of Facebook, um, Cambridge Analytica, where they were targeting illegally, you know, the, the Tory party as part of the Leave campaign, including the DUP here. They were, you know, deliberately, and in some cases there was illegality in retaining the information of voters who were using social media. They were playing to their fears around immigration, um, around healthcare and around other issues. And we need to be thinking tactically around how we combat that, how we get the message across, how people are informed. And I think discussions like this, but we also need to have education programs running where people understand the economic system, because folks, even if we get a socialist republic tomorrow, there are international external pressures which can squeeze us, which can restrict what we can deliver. You're seeing this at the minute in Venezuela, you can see it in Cuba, you can see it in other socialist countries. So having a socialist republic in the morning, it doesn't end there. Your activism, for me, it, it just never ends. Do you know, because you have these external pressures that you're going to continually fight as well. And that's why getting in and educating people, starting at a kitchen stay, meeting around a family table or neighbours and having the debates and the conversations. But then from that then, we need groups of working groups, whether it's government, trade union movement, the broad Republican movement, need to be coming forward with proposals. Well, what is your idea of proposal? It's okay getting up all of us and pontificating and saying, you know, from a principal point of view, this is what I would do. Well, show me that in reality. What does it mean? What does it look like? What does it mean to my pocket? Because that's how my friend, you know, am I going to be worse off in my pocket? And that's how she looks at it. So how do I convince her? Um, and I need to have all of those facts and information. And that's why it's important. This is going to be a process as we're moving forward. You know, a date could be set with a, with a, beyond all of our controls. And that's why we need to be prepared now, no matter what your view is on it. We need to be prepared and say, what is the type of Ireland we want to live in? It's easy saying the proclamation. We can all say that, but what does that mean? How do we get the money to do it? Where do you get the money for a healthcare system? When you look at the likes of Cuba who are being strung by America and by embargoes, how do we then sustain our economy? How do we sustain a healthcare system? And how do we keep the momentum where people are bought in to that socialist ideal? And that's not easy in a more globalised world, in a world of social media, where they're being fed other messages. So it's not easy, um, but we need to build that momentum collectively uh, to do it. Sir, thanks, Terry, because you're, you're spot on the money there. I think your question, Frank, is one of the best. It's it's really really key to what's at stake here. How do we answer those questions? But I think it goes back to the phrase I used at the very end: If socialism is the future, we've got to start building it today. We've got to look at how we force through. On one hand, for to directly address your neighbour and all Ireland. National Health Service that's free at the point of entry to all who come in. And we've got to then look, there's no point talking about this is something into the future. We've got to actually start today to build that and look at how we can bring it about. We've got to look at, as Deirdre talks about, the trade union movement. We can't afford, we can't afford to say that the trade union movement should do this if we're not within the trade union movement, if we're not battling from within the trade union movement, if we're not asking everybody we know join the bloody movement because you can't sit back and say listen why are they not doing it if we're not prepared to battle for it ourselves if we're not willing to take on to the state to 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 do the work but all of this actually can be paid for cuba as you talk about under the most brutal sanctions has one of the finest health services in south of southern america and latin america so it can be done we can do it we can demonstrate how we can do it but what we've got to do is look for what currents within society, within the wider community, need this and will support it. One obvious movement would be the trade union movement, which we have got to bring from its, its every tower and force it through participation into doing something about it. We've got to get in, in touch with your local Sinn Féin rep and say, what the hell are you doing? You know, we can criticise them from a distance and say, why, you know, why is Sinn Féin not doing this? Why is somebody else not doing it? Let's, let, let's put it up to them. Let's say what we need is a comprehensive health service. 
One of the big things here is to remove privatisation. That's the big, the big problem we have in the Republic, where there was a brutal case within the last couple of days where, I think it was Limerick, where a baby died within hours of being born because his mother had, did not have private health insurance. And when she went into the hospital with the baby hours before delivery, she was sent to a register instead of a consultant. Had she had private health care, she would have been sent to a consultant and presumably the chief child would have lived. It's the most obscene example of privatisation where you can buy human life. We've got to ensure that that cannot happen, but we've got to put the pressure on. We've got to outline what can be done. Remove privatisation, because once privatisation comes in, and it's happening in the north here as well, it's happening right across the United Kingdom, where of all people, Richard Branson, of Virgin Media, he's running private health care, and in a very insidious, in a very invidious, insidious way, they're doing it a little bit here and a little bit there, and we can see it creeping in, so we've got to, we've got to stop that. And I think that's the point about it, to, to, to look at it from the ground up, what do we do about it? But we've got to start building it now. There's no point waiting until we have removed partition and we build a socialist republic before we can deliver a national health service. And, and I'm talking, when I talk about national health service, I'm not talking about just for the north, I'm talking about a national, an, an Irish 32 county wide health service. And we can do it, it's an ideal thing to do. It's essential that we do it. And that's how we prove that this system will work when we have it in place. Uh, listen, folks, we're a bit pressed for time here, so uh, if anyone has a last question, I just want to say, the first thing I want to say, Fancy, it's great having me here. It's burning me that if we can talk with pre previous generations, I see Fancy, I see Jim there, Jamie, Iver, I could go on, Manny, I could go on, on. It's great having people from, from, from previous uh, generations just struggle coming, coming back, and I hope we don't mind this, but I'm around to the point of pensioners. But uh, it's, <laughs> um, listen, listen, listen. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to do <laughs> But I'm not far off. It's supposed to be a comedy. Yeah, yeah. Um, soft, soft nationalists um, and soft the nationalists in the twenty. <laughs> so when you said when you said soft nationalist, uh, soft nationalist pensioners, um, two things. First thing you need to say, your friend's not going to have a pension or decent health care unless we talk seriously about socialism. Is it because because the, the right, especially the, the right, aren't going to finish until they take the last sausage off my chest before. We know that. Um, we need socialism. We have we, for that reason. But soft nationalist pensioners can very turn in, very quickly turn into radical nationalist pensioners. Uh, I remember uh, 20 years ago. God, we come along with way in 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the REC tried to shove uh, an orange march through the, the Derry Bay Housing Estate in Newry. Uh, it sounds it's crazy. We won't put up with it now. It says enough. It says everything about how far we've come on. But the soft nationalist pensioners, I remember seeing them with me when he's digging up, digging up stones out of the ground to hand the, the, the young radical nationalists to stop it, you know. And and also myself and a couple of comrades went to, to Catalonia. And in Catalonia, I think only in the 1990s there was barely 16% of the population uh, were proactively supportive of independence. As a direct result of the type of thing we're promoting here tonight, uh, but barely three or four years ago, by the time the, the Spanish military were busting up the ballot boxes, over 50% of people were voting proactively for independence. We marched through the streets of Barcelona on the first anniversary of that referendum. And the, what would have been the soft nationalist pensioners, if you want to call it, they were out in the ballot. It was, it, it was one of the most frightening, the most encouraging things I've seen in my life. The pensioners who couldn't march because they weren't fit, um, they were out in the balconies buying pots and pans off the off the, the grills and the balconies and it was what, what that really struck home for me was at times of struggle at times of struggle uh, people come out of their shells including the soft nationalists and uh, I'd repeat what McCormick right up there he, he says this this is within our grasp we can feel it coming and I, I have no doubt in my mind when it comes to the soft nationalist pensioners will be will be behind us as well.